Welcome to the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast, where we hope to inspire you to embrace your God-given gifts, skills, and passions in order to lead with confidence. We want you to remember that you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, and you are fully loved by Him. You have been designed on purpose by God with unique gifts and passions in order to love and lead those around you. I'm your host, Esther Littlefield, a pastor's wife, business owner, mom, and writer. And I'm Esther's co-host, Holly Kane. I'm a wife, mom, and business owner. I also write at hollycane.org, where I focus on my passion for women's ministry. Together, we chat about important issues that Christian women leaders face. In addition, we interview other women just like you who lead in various roles from church to community to business. Through this podcast, we offer you encouragement, tools, and resources to help you on your leadership journey. We are so glad you're here with us. Hello, friend, and welcome to episode 144 of the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Esther Littlefield, and I want to thank you for joining us on today's episode. You are going to hear part two of a conversation with best-selling author, personal development expert, and host of The Christy Wright Show, Christy Wright. If you haven't listened to episode 143 yet, I want to encourage you to just pause this and go back and take a listen to that one, which came out last week, the episode right prior to this, because this conversation is just a a continuation of that one. So it's going to make a lot more sense if you have heard that one first. Now, normally we do not split our conversations, our interviews into two parts, but this was so good and it went much longer than usual. So we really wanted to make sure that you get to hear both parts of the conversation. So that's why it's broken up into two. All right, today we are talking with Christy about some more of the themes in her devotional, Living True, 40 Days to Get Back to You. You will hear the trait of God that has meant the most to Christy over the years, how to discern if a dream is from you or from God. Side note, I really love the tips that she gives for this one, as well as what to do when your ambitions as a leader or your dreams for the future don't line up with the season you're currently in. And we talk about how to handle that and how to move forward. Christy also shares with us how we can hold on to hope for the future, even when things don't work out the way we had hoped. Finally, you're going to hear a word of encouragement from Christy that I know will make an impact on your day. All right, friend, let's jump in to part two of our conversation with Christy Wright. I want to kind of talk about each of the sections in your book a little bit, if we can get to it. And you start the book by diving into who God is and why that's important to figuring out how to get back to who you truly are. And I'm wondering if there was one truth about God that has meant the most to you over the course of your life. Yeah. So the the interesting part of starting with who God is, aside from the fact that we're made in the image of God. The other important truth I think we need to remember of why we start here is God knows us better than we do. We think we know our, ourselves the best. We know what we need. We we know how things should go. We're planners. We're the cruise director of our life. And God has such better plans and such, and he just knows us better than we do. So I think it's, that's why it's so important to start there. But I think it was day two, maybe day two. I kept it towards the beginning on purpose because it was so important to me. God is faithful. And I know that we've heard that one million times. I know that. But if we are not careful, we will miss his faithfulness because we don't see it, because it happens gradually, because um, we get so used to it. So, you know, if you're a journaler, then if you go back and look at old journals, you will see the testimony of God's faithfulness. If you're not a journaler, though, and I'm not a great journaler, I've only gotten better in recent years, then it's easy to miss. It's easy to look up and go, I'm living things I prayed my whole life for. I'm living things that are better than what I ever prayed for. And we will miss just how faithful he is because it comes in unlikely packages or unlikely timing, or we just so quickly get used to whatever that thing is, that prayer that's answered. We miss how faithful he is. But I think the reason that principle is so true or so important for us to remember is when we are in the valley, when we I'm going to try not to get emotional here because I'm, I'm, there's a couple things that I'm holding like this right now, Lord. 
we can remember, God, you were faithful then. You will be faithful again. And I know how that worked out. So I feel okay about that, but I don't know how this is going to work out. And I'm holding it with open hands and my heart is laid bare. Lord, I know you're faithful. I know you're faithful. You can talk yourself through those seasons of desire, of wanting, of heartbreak, of valley, of unknown, where you're holding your life, your heart, your desires with open hands. And you can remind yourself, you are faithful, not because I deserve it, not sometimes, not when things are easy. You are faithful all the time because that is who you are. And I can bank my life on it, that you are faithful. And I think that that truth can carry you through the good times and the bad times. And the good times are giving God glory because he's so faithful. And in the valley, you're going, God, I know, I know you're faithful. I can trust your faithfulness. You always have been. You've never missed a day. You've never taken a day off. You've never taken a sick day. You are faithful because that's who you are. And I think that in light of the journaling example, or look, even if you just look back on your past and think, okay, let me look back on the last 10 years and think of times God's been faithful. Let me think back to my childhood when God's faithful. Why that exercise is so powerful in building faith is it not only gets you through these valleys and these challenges when things are unknown and things are uncertain and you're scared and you're overwhelmed, not just that, you're training yourself to see him again. You're training yourself to identify his voice again. Let me give you an example. The, the devotional I did this January. So, so when I started in 2018 doing the devotional for our company, it was the first one of that year. So like January 4th or whatever it was, I've been the first Devo speaker every year since then. So I, like when I say God has brought me into this space, it's like, it's just continued to snowball. Well, this year I taught on the miraculous catch of fish. So there's two miraculous catches of fish in the Bible. There's one where Jesus called his disciples and there's another where Jesus appeared to his disciple after his resurrection. So the, one is at the beginning of one of the gospels. One is at the end of one of the gospels. I'm not gonna be able to cite it correctly for you because I don't have it in front of me right now. But what's so interesting is when Jesus came to the disciples in the, when he appeared to them, so he's already appeared to them in the upper room twice since his resurrection. So they know they can see him even though he has been crucified and risen. So it's not like this is the first time. He calls out to them, haven't you caught any fish? Okay, they're out on the boat. It's out, you know, it's, it's hard to, they don't know it's him. They don't recognize Jesus, even though this is a man that they knew well, walked with intimately, knew very intimately. It was when he said, cast the net on the other side. In that moment, John, who had been there when he called the disciples, when he said, cast the net on the other side and they caught all the fish, it was John who said, it is the Lord. And Peter jumps in the water. They recognized him. Why? Because they said, oh, he did that before. That's Jesus. He did that before and he's doing it again. This was this God we going, remember us? Remember when I called you? Remember what I did for you then? I'm doing it again. Remember what I could do before? I can do it again. When we recognize God in our past, we are more likely to recognize him in our present and in our future. And it's a very, very powerful exercise to look back on his faithfulness because you will begin to identify his faithfulness in your present and you will begin to believe him for faithfulness in the future. Thank you for taking us to church today, Christy. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> oh, it's, it's so good. It's so good. We have two gears, asleep and full speed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. And really the faithfulness of God is is just so amazing. And I love that you remind us to take that time and really reflect because it is so easy in the pace of our lives to just overlook and miss it. And then when we're in the crisis, right. we're like, where are you, God? Why aren't you showing up? Right. And it's often because we just haven't taken the time to look for it. Right. So it's such a good reminder. So in section two of the book, you talk about this idea of, of who we are, you know, yeah. who God has made us to be, which we love talking about here on the podcast. And specifically, you're talking one of the chapters or one of the days is about that you're created with God given desires and, you know, dreams and, and things that he's put in your heart. But sometimes it's hard to figure out, is this a dream from God or mm -hmm. is this just a selfish ambition or desire mm -hmm. of my own. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that and how we discern that in our lives? Yeah, that's a million dollar question, right? <laughs> like that's the question I've gotten for years about business beauty. I'll give you, this is not a perfect formula, but I'll give you some, some tips, you know, to just kind of like work this together in a way that works for you. 
the one thing I would say is while God is not a perfect formula that you can put in a box and say A plus B always equals C, he writes our stories very differently. He is true to his character in scripture. So he is consistent. He will never lead you in a way that is perpendicular to scripture or to his character. If you have an idea that is immoral, it's not God's idea. He's never going to lead you in a way that is against his character or his nature or his word. So that's a very easy, um, again, it's not a formula, but that is a principle that, that is just proven. The second thing I would say is, if you can name your fear, like if you have fears about this, like I want to do something new, but I'm scared. If you can name your fear, it might be wisdom that is holding you back. And that's wisdom you should heed. That's fear you should heed. You, you should pray about it and, and work through. But if you can't name it, if you can't nail it down, it's probably fear you should push through because God wants to do something through you and the enemy doesn't want that to happen. So let me give you an example. Let's say that someone's listening right now. I'll use a business example since I've got a million examples of those. And someone has a dream in their heart to start a business or start a nonprofit or start a ministry. And this idea just keeps stirring in them and it keeps them up at night. It feels so personal and vulnerable that they've not even said it out loud because it feels silly and ridiculous. They maybe haven't even journaled about it because it feels silly and ridiculous. Maybe haven't even prayed about it because it feels silly and ridiculous, but it's in them. It's in them. And if you were to ask them and say, what are you scared of? And they say, I don't know. I just... I don't know. I don't know. That's from God. You need to speak that out loud. You need to write that down. That stirring in you, there is something God is doing because he wants to bring that out of you in some way, shape, or form. Now, let's use another example. And you say, I've got this idea to start a business, but I'm scared to do it. Okay, why are you scared? Well, I'm scared because I have four kids under the age of five and my husband's deployed. Okay, okay, that might be wisdom. Might be wisdom. Might not be the time to have your startup business with four kids under age five. That's just like, you've got a practical reason. But what's interesting about fear is fear when you can't nail it down or when you have these feelings and you can't nail them down, it's most likely fear. A shadow that haunts you, that lurks in the, it's the boogie monster under the bed and you can't nail it. So it always haunts you because it's always just like, I don't know, I don't know, uh, what will people think? And what if I fail and what if it doesn't work? That's just fear. And the Lord can absolutely provide for you. He, he has a path for you. Like if he has desires for you, he's gonna fulfill those desires. All you have to do is trust them with him. But if there's some real practical side of it where you're like, I, you know, I don't think this now's the time because of this, I'll give you an example. I I felt the Lord stirring in me to do something new about a year ago and it wasn't the right time, but I felt the stirring. I acknowledged the stirring, didn't say it out loud to anyone. Only in the last four months, I've said it out loud to three people. And in the last week I've taken action on it, but this has been an evolution of God starts stirring and then I'm identifying what is the right time and I'm listening to his prompting. I will give you a resource though, because I'm certainly not an expert on this. I don't have it all figured out, but Discerning the voice of God by Priscilla Shire rocked my world in hearing from God and discerning his path for my life. And again, it's not a perfect formula. Still, I'm always going, okay, God, is this you? What about this? What about this? I will say too, in my own experience, God is okay with you wrestling with him that he tells you something and you argue and he tells you something and you tell him why it won't work. And he tells you something and you ask questions and he tells you something and you ignore it. And he tells you again, he's okay He's pretty persistent. He's going to follow up. So if you have this idea and it won't go away, I would probably bet it's God's because he's more persistent than you are with his ideas, than you are with your ideas. And so if it just keeps coming up, I would just say tiny steps of faith, journal it, say it out loud to someone you trust and let that take, it will take on a life of its own if you do those two things. If you get it out of your head and on paper and then out of your head and to another person, it will gain new levels of power and take on a life of its own. And the Holy Spirit will then begin to lead that and show you the path and the steps before you. But if you keep it locked up in your head and your heart, you're gonna be wrestling with that idea by yourself and trying to lean on your own discernment only for a very long time. So I would say, if you can't get rid of that idea, put it on paper, say it out loud and then see what happens. 
Mm. I love that sort of litmus test on the fear that you talked about. I think it's so important to be able to identify if you can identify, identify it. And then if not, you know, maybe it is something to push through. And then those practical steps, I think, yeah, just gold. (laughs) If anyone, if anyone's like a, um, this might be hard because it's kind of a generalization in terms of like our personality style, but I will say if I cry, when I say something out loud, it is from the Lord. I know that sounds Mm -hmm. silly, but you want a litmus test? If you say it out loud and you can't get through it, like I'll give you another practical example because I can actually share this one because I'm not ready to share the other one. (laughs) You will see in about six months. But I was speaking at an event. This was a couple years ago and it was, I was taking an older talk and adapting it for a different audience. That was a non-business audience. It was our smart conference. So it was just general audience, men and women and not about business. But the talk was very powerful and the principles applied, but I needed a different closing story. And I was trying to think of what story that was going to be. I love to close with the story. It really like lets things hit home. And I was, I was sitting in bed with my husband and we were kind of like sitting up against the the headboard and reading and talking. And I said, yeah, I'm just trying to think of what a, a good closing story would be for the smart conference. Like I've got the talk, but I don't know what the story would be. And the Lord brought to my mind the story of when I reconnected with my dad after six years, when I found him, when I was 14, he had mm-hmm. been out of my life since I was eight. And I kind of felt caught off guard because it was so not my idea. I hadn't thought of that story since it happened. Like that's not one of my stories in my, in my vault of stories I write or use or talk about. I hadn't thought of that story. And so it was so clearly from the Lord, but then I still was going, Lord, will you help me discern if this is right? Is this my idea or your idea? Because if it's my idea, I don't want it. I don't want to do what I think is clever. I don't want to be manipulative to make people cry. I don't want to be manipulative to make people laugh. I don't want to use the stage to to make them feel something that I want them to feel. I want to know that this story is your idea because it's going to help people in a way that you know they need. You know their hearts. You know what they're walking in with. And you know this story is going to help it hit home. And when I said it out loud to my husband, I cried. And when I said it, and then again, I I talked to my leader. I said, I'm thinking about this story, but I'm just trying to check myself. I'm trying to really check my heart on this story. And as I said the story out loud, again, I cried. And it was like, this is the story I'm supposed to tell. And so I would say, again, we want to put things in bucket. It's either us or God. It can be both. It can be God's Mm -hmm. idea and also be a great story that sets you up as a speaker. It can be God's idea and something that benefits you personally, a, a side business. God God gives you the side business. And oh, by the way, you're going to earn an income from your family. You know what I mean? And so whenever you, you see, it doesn't have to be, well, if I benefit from this, then it must not be from God. No, no, no. God can give you ideas that are his ideas and they bless you or benefit you or advance you in some way. And that doesn't mean it's not, again, it doesn't mean you're selfish. It doesn't mean it's only you. But I would say that if you cry, when you say that thing out loud, for me, that's always a clue. Man, man, that's something I'm supposed to do. One other thing I'll say about the God-given desires, and this is the verse I believe I put in the devotional for that day, because it's one of my life verses. Psalm 37, four says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. When we seek him, Mm. when we look to God, I genuinely believe he will not let us go astray. Now, if you're not seeking God, he will let you walk right off a cliff. But if you're seeking God, he will not let you go astray. So as you seek him, he will show you what your desires are. So if you are having desires rise up in you in seeking the Lord, you can almost always guarantee those are from the Lord because you are in step with the spirit. You are in tune with the spirit. You are seeking the Lord. Now, if you are not seeking the Lord and you are not living your life right and you're not in tune with God and you're not listening to his voice and you're not, you're just, you're living your own life, doing your own thing. He will let you make mistakes and he'll let you, re- let you reap the consequences of those mistakes. But I think for people, the majority of people that are listening are probably seeking the Lord. If you're even asking that question, if you seek the Lord, he will not let you go wrong. I believe that. I believe he goes before you, behind you, beside you, and he guides you where he wants you to go. He is not a trickster trying to be hard, playing hard to get. He's not making it difficult to find him. When you seek him, you will find him, the the Bible says. And so you can know those desires you feel and find in seeking him are from him. So that's one more thing I would say. I love that that verse for that reason. It's such a good reminder, Christy. And I remember hearing a friend say one time something similar, like pay attention to your tears 
Mm-hmm. Pay attention to that because that is often, even not when you say it aloud, but when you hear somebody else talk about something yes. and it yes. chokes you up, it's like, there's yes. a reason. And it's That's often right. the Holy Spirit speaking right. to us. So. So in the third section of your book, you talk about where you are in this concept of seasons. And I think that's so important as a leader to identify this concept of seasons. And you discuss the seasons of priorities. And so how can this concept help a woman who wants to be a leader, has a passion or a dream, but life circumstances don't necessarily match up to what she's wanting to pursue? What would you say to her? You know, this is a great question about priorities because I think one of the things that is discouraging for me as being a busy mom, leader, woman with a lot of interests is I want to do everything Mm -hmm. all the time, all of it. It's all important. It has to all be done today. And I will tell you, um, you know, as I'm living this life balance content, because my book is coming out in September, it's called Take Back Your Time. And the premise of the book is life balance is not doing everything for an equal amount of time. It's about doing the right things at the right time. When you do the right things at the right time, you feel a sense of balance. So it's not about doing everything anyway. Now, I know the reason I bring this up is because as I'm living this content, working in the manuscript right now, it has helped me personally because I ask myself every day, what is right right now? So Mm -hmm. today might be someone is listening to this today, the right thing is to take care of their sick parent. That's the right thing right now. It's to abandon the the business projects and focus on their parent. Another day, the right thing is to go on the road and travel for work. That's the right thing that day. That's the right thing that week. It doesn't mean they don't love their kids. It doesn't mean they're never going to spend time with their kids, but it allows you to know what is right right now. Everything is not right all the time. And it allows you to be present where you are, shake the guilt and then really focus on what is most important in the moment. And so while there are things that I would love to do, I would love to travel to Europe. I would love to get a dog. I would love to, what was the other thing I want to do? Buy a pontoon boat. I would love to play on an adult soccer league again. These are all things I genuinely want to do. But instead of getting discouraged, like, well, I can't do those ever, never. My dreams are dying. My dreams of a dog are dying. For, no, no, no. I just tell myself it's not right right now. Just because it's not right right now doesn't mean it's never. It's just not right now. I'm in a season of little kids that I don't want to leave to go to Europe. I'm in a season of little kids and I don't have the emotional energy or physical energy for a dog. I'm in a season of little kids. These things are not right right now. What's right right now? My work projects and my little kids that drive me crazy and I love very much and are very exhausting. (laughs) That's what's right right now. And so when you do the right things at the right time, you feel a sense of balance and you are give yourself permission to be present and focus knowing there's a day I'll probably go to Europe. There's a day I'll probably get a dog. There's a day I'll probably play on an adult soccer league again. And that's awesome. And then I can be present right now knowing it doesn't mean never. It just means not right now. And so I think if you ask yourself truly, what is right right now? What is right in this season of my life? What is realistic and healthy and good for me? What are my priorities right now? And even on a micro level, what's my priorities this week? might be slightly different than what the priorities are in this season. Maybe this is a heavy season of work, but this week, man, you're going to take a vacation or spring break. And then even more micro, what's right today? What do I need today? You know, one of the things I've started doing on a practical level, level I'll share with you guys. I have in the past planned my week and that sounds nice in theory, but on Monday, I'm all bright eyed and bushy tailed and I'm writing a to-do list of 17 things I'm going to do per day, every day. <laughs> and then by the time Thursday comes, I'm exhausted, not getting through my to-do list. And what do I do? I beat myself up for it. Mm-hmm. So what I've started to do is I still think about my week ahead of what are the, the calendar commitments, but I only make my to-do list daily. At the beginning of the day, I check in with myself. How am I feeling? What has changed about my plans or appointments or commitments? What's my energy level? What are my priorities today? And I set my to-do list for that day in relation to how I'm feeling that day. And then sometimes that to-do list is seven things because I'm super energetic. And sometimes it's zero. I've had days where I'm like, I'm not, I think today was actually one of those days. I've got a full work day and it said things to-do list for today. Nothing. I'm I'm, going to choose to not put anything on my to-do list today to hold my feet to the fire, to beat myself up for. So Again, that, I think that thesis, uh, that premise of, of this book coming out, which is what I'm so excited about, gives women such permission to be present and shake the guilt of not getting everything done because that's all we do is focus on what we didn't get to and instead do the right things 
at the right time. So ask yourself, what is right right now? And do that. It's so important, Christy. And I think that so many of our listeners are multi-passionate because Same, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's what you're speaking to. That's what I identify with. And I completely identify with that desire to do all the things and get them all done this year. Like if right. this year doesn't work out, then everything is, right. you know, out the window. And I think 2020 showed us that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we got to be willing to not do everything all at once. So, so good to have those reminders. All right. So you wrap up your book with talking about the future and talking about where we're going. And I think sometimes we have this idea of our future where, you know, it's, it's almost like you were saying before, we're afraid to speak what we actually want for the future because we're kind of like, oh, but if that doesn't happen, right. And so it feels like there is sometimes the extremes, once again, of holding on so tightly to what we believe we want the future to look like, the plan that we have created in our mind versus the other end of the extreme of just kind of giving up on dreaming and hoping and planning at all. Right. right. So where is the balance? Where do we find the middle place between that? And how can we trust God with the future looking ahead? Yeah, I love that. So I, I joked in the beginning and I said, we're going to work like it all depends on us and pray like it all depends on God. I think that for whatever that thing is for you, let's say that it's a project, a dream, business, whatever. I think you do all that you can. I think you do all that you can. You give it all you've got. And then you let God have the rest. So let me use a silly example. When my husband and I bought our first house, the house we now live in. So we've lived, it's our only house we've ever bought, but about eight years ago, I guess is when we bought it. So we were, had been married a year. We didn't have any kids and we had a budget of what we could spend on a house. And it was a number we literally made up out of thin air, not at all in relation to the housing market or what we, <laughs> what was realistic. And we found this house that was listed. It was just way, way bigger and more awesome than anything we could have dreamt of in a perfect neighborhood. It was four bedroom. It was just like, I mean, our minds couldn't even conceive it at, you know, newly married but it was way underpriced. So we made an offer on this house at list price. And that was very close to the top of our budget. It wasn't the top of our budget, it was very close. We offered list price and we're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're doing this. Well, they came back, the realtors, because it was so underpriced and the housing market was crazy back then. They said, we've got multiple offers in the first 24 hours, bring your highest and best. So we came back and we offered the top of our budget, the top that we were comfortable with. We're like, this is the best we can do. It was $10,000 over the list price. We're like, this is, this is it. If we don't get this house at this price, we're not supposed to have it. And we drew that line and we got the house. Now, the reason I use that example, because it's financial, because it's an actual number, and that's not always as easy in other decisions, but I think you have to work as hard as you can, give it all you've got to a reasonable level that you're going, I feel good giving this much, trying this hard, knocking down these doors, making these phone calls, taking this effort. And for some people, it'll be way over here. And for some people, it'll be, I'm just comfortable here, whatever that looks like. And then at that point, you go, I'm going to give it to God. If it does not work out, it's because I'm not supposed to have this. I'm not supposed to do this. I'm going to trust it's because God has something better because I really believe in God's sovereignty, not in a passive way that I'm just a puppet sitting by and I'm not supposed to be responsible or be a good steward. But if I give something, everything I've got and it still doesn't work out, it's because God didn't want it to work out because God can see something I can't. He knows something I don't. And he genuinely is either protecting me or has something better or is doing something in me. I had a friend just text me last night, actually, and she was telling me about building a house, another house example. They're trying to build a house and they want this lot. And there's this other family going for the lot. She goes, I'm just praying it works out. I'm praying it works out. And I responded, well, if it doesn't, for some reason, it's because God has something better. Jesus, take the wheel, right? Like, it's like, you're gonna give it all you got. But if something does not work out for you and you gave it all you got, you did all that you could, God is not up in heaven going, oh man, I didn't know. I'm sorry. I didn't know about that other family. Gosh, I should have, <laughs> I should have paid more attention. Gabriel, man, we were busy over there and we didn't see that over there. No, he knows. He knows everything. He can do anything. And if something is not working out for you, it is for your good. He works all things together for your good. And it's because he has something better or he sees something you don't. He knows something you don't and he's protecting you or doing something in you along the way. You have to trust the outcome and his sovereignty, even when things don't work out like you want. 
That's so good because so often we look at circumstances like that and we assign failure to them when it may not actually be the case. We've given everything. We gave it over to God. We left it in his hands and he's choosing to guide our lives in such a way because he knows better than us. Mm -hmm. And when we assign failure, we miss out on seeing God's guiding hand in those things. And so I just love that reminder. So true. So on this podcast, we believe that leaders are learners and we know our guests have really great resources to share. So I would love to know if there is a book or a podcast or other resource that you've been learning from lately. And if you could share that with our audience. Yes. Well, full confession, I'm always reading like several books at a time. So I'll like jump in and out of them. So one book that I have been reading for a long time, because it's kind of a difficult read, is called The Drama of Scripture. I don't know who it's by, Ooh. but it's an overarching story arc of the biblical story from Genesis to Revelation and kind of the story arc. But then I actually, I heard you guys had Brittany in on your show and I have been reading her book, Falling in Love with God's Word. And that is a more consumable way to have a story arc of the Bible, which I love <laughs> on the, the time management, which I've been deep in is the, the ruthless elimination of hurry mm. by John Mark Comer is a fantastic book, which is awesome. And it's again, fascinating, but also just like has a lot of Christian principles in it. It's just a great reminder for busy moms and for leaders that are struggling with managing their time. And then I haven't started it yet, but I'm about to start it. Lisa Harper has a new devotional, which I'm excited to start. I think it's called Live live maybe, but yeah. So just, I'm kind of in and out of a bunch of books all, all at one time. <laughs> mm. I love, I love it. Lisa Harper. Yes. <laughs> And, and Holly and I both are multiple multiple books at one time <laughs> as well. So you got Audible going, got the devotional by the book, oh, yeah. by the bed, all that. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, well, Christy, we just so appreciate everything you have shared in this episode. I know this is going to bless every single woman that listens and they'll be encouraged. So we always like to ask, you know, where can people connect with you? But I also want to give you the chance if there's anything else that we didn't ask you that you want to say or share here at the end, this is your, your opportunity to share and then just tell people how they can connect with you and and continue, you know, hearing what you have to share. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I love what you guys are doing and I'm just happy to support you guys in any way that I can. You can find me at christywright.com. Instagram is at Christy B. Wright. I'm on Instagram more than I am Facebook, but Facebook's official Christy Wright. But all the stuff is christywright.com where you can, can find anything I'm up to in books and that kind of stuff. The one thing I think I'll leave you with, if I just have a closing thought, there was a, a devotional, one of the entries in section three of the devotional, Living True. It's the very last one. So I guess this would be 29 or 30 would be the day. And I tell a story of, when I was really, really discouraged and going through a really tough season, a wilderness season. And I had a experience on stage where I was just humiliated, where someone embarrassed me and made a hateful comment. And I walked out to my car and just cried and cried and cried because I'd had a really hard time. And I just kind of cried out, God, do you, do you even see me? Do you even see what I'm going through? Do you see how hard this is? Do you even see me? And I let myself have a good cry. And then I um, drove to work and went about my day through meetings. But when I walked in the office, I went up to the fourth floor back at our old building and I was going to a meeting in one of our meeting rooms. And I saw this woman across the fourth floor wave at me. She was an acquaintance. I mean, we were buddies, but not like best friends or anything. She waved and kind of like started walking towards me with, with intention, you know, like really kind of coming, coming towards me. Like she wanted to tell me something and she stopped me and she kind of skipped the small talk. And she said, I just, I feel compelled to tell you something. God sees you. I just feel like I'm supposed to tell you God sees you. And she had no idea what she was saying, but I did. And just for anyone listening right now that is going through a hard time, that is scared, that is nervous, that is working so hard and they're so tired and you don't feel like you're enough for your kids and you don't feel like you're enough for your business and you don't feel like you're enough for this job and you don't feel like you're enough for this life. I just want you to know that God sees you. He sees you right now, right where you are. He sees you. And he's with you. And I think that while it doesn't change our circumstances or our level of exhaustion, there's such comfort in knowing that the God of the universe that is faithful and loving and knows everything and can do anything sees you right now. Thank you so much on behalf of Esther and I and our listeners. I know that there's been so many gold nuggets in here that have really touched my heart and have been words I've needed to hear. And so thank you so much for just speaking the truth that God has laid on your heart and just 
for being you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And we so appreciate it. And if you don't mind, I'd like to switch gears just a smidge at this very tail end and ask you a fun question. Do you mind Let's that? I love fun. Okay. So the internet has been all a flutter about side parts and skinny jeans. So are okay. you aware of this? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have heard something about side parts, but okay. you need to educate me on this. Okay. So the next generation has canceled side parts. So the <laughs> coolest thing now is a middle part. No. And the sort of more baggy, straight jeans are Mom now jeans. an in thing. Okay. What's that? Mom jeans are back. Mom jeans. Like, like Mom high waisted jeans. and and like yes. baggy. <laughs> yeah. And so our generation is stepping back and saying, no, we will not give up our side parts and our skinny jeans. We've made it here and we can't go that direction. We came from mom jeans when we were younger and we've made it this far. You can't make us go back. <laughs> oh, so I'm wondering if you have any opinions or thoughts on this. <laughs> yes. So here's what's funny when it comes to fashion or trends. Okay. I treat it like a cafeteria. I take what I like. I ignore the rest. Yep. And then I also have a tendency to hang on to things way after they're cool. Yep. So tie-dye has been back for a while. Let me tell you, tie-dye never went out for me. I am an 80s <laughs> child. So white kids, white jeans, white jean jackets, and tie-dye has been my staples since the 80s. So the fact that they're back is just convenient for me. But yes. should they go away, I'm not going anywhere because I love me some tie-dye. It's just convenient mm -hmm. it happens to be in so I can find more right now. So no, no one looks good with the side part. No one looks good in baggy jeans, or at least I don't. So I'm going to stick with what I like. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, and you know, the whole like sweats as just regular no. wear is back. And for those of us who have some lumpy middles, that's not a good look. <laughs> and so I'm going to stay away from that one with some passion. <laughs> you got to do what's right for you. You got to do what's right for you. There was something like a year um, for business boutique, not this last fall, but the fall before that. So in 2019, I just had my daughter, Mary Grace. And I literally texted my girlfriends because I'd been wearing maternity clothes for a year. So I was like, hey, what's in right now? And my girlfriend that lives in New York that literally knows what is for sure in, she's like, big blazers that are plaid. And she texts me all these pictures from Pinterest mm -hmm. that like Taylor Swift and these giant oversized blazers that are plaid. I was like, yeah, no, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not for me. So then I just found something else, found a leather jacket and went about my life, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was like, yep. you got to take what you like and leave the rest. <laughs> Well, I oh. love that. I love that. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. We so appreciate it. Oh, y'all are awesome. I just, anytime I can support you guys, let me know. I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, would you consider leaving us a rating and review in your podcast app? This helps more women just like you find the podcast and it also helps them to know whether the podcast would be a good fit for them. Just go to the show in your podcast app, then scroll down until you see the option for ratings and reviews. From there, you can tap to rate and write a review. It means the world to us when you take a couple minutes to do this. And thank you so much to everyone who has left a review. Now, don't forget, your leadership matters, and it's time for you to embrace your gifts and lead with confidence.